Hello. I'm honored to be here uh, and delighted to be on the same panel with Raj Chetty. I find it hard to compete with his millions and millions of data points, so I'm not going to use PowerPoint. I'm just going to talk um, a bit about his uh, research and policy conclusions, and then about some of my own work. I couldn't agree more uh, with his final conclusion that good teachers matter. Um, and by the end of my talk, I'll probably, I hope to convince you that they matter e perhaps even more uh, than he concluded in his remarks. At the same time, um, I'm not sure I agree with the implications for policy um, and for teacher evaluation policies in particular of all the work that um, Professor Chetty and his colleagues have done. But let me first return, uh, turn to some of my own work using North Carolina data. I don't have 2.5 million students, but in a lot of my work I have close to a million. Um, the simple question I want to address first is, um, do teachers learn on the job? That is, do they become more effective as they gain experience? Now, for the teachers in the audience, this may seem like a silly question. Obviously, it takes experience <laughs> to figure out how to deal with all the challenges you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Teaching is not the same thing as what a master carpenter does as he's um, working with an inanimate piece of wood. What you're all dealing with is real people, young people, with their own wills, motivations, and emotions. And some of them may not even want to be there in the classroom. So you've got a huge management task. And, the argue, and everything I've read out of the education literature suggests that experience matters. Gaining, seeing lots of different situations help you deal with new situations as they arise. Now, that's not quite the lesson that comes out of the work of many economists, um, people like me and like Raj Chetty, who look at the question of teacher experience. The conventional wisdom that comes out of that research is often the following. Novice teachers are less effective than teachers who have two or three years of experience. In other words, teachers gain a lot during their first couple of years ex of experience. But the conventional wisdom among many economists who look at this is those gains stop after four or five years. I don't think that's the right answer. And that's why I've been looking at this using data on middle school teachers and students in North Carolina. Um, so we've got data on every single middle school student, and by that I mean students in sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, regardless of the grade configuration of the school. And we're trying to estimate whether uh, there are returns to experience as one goes further up the experience uh, or years of experience. We find, and this comes through very clearly, that teachers do continue to improve, to develop as they gain experience. And this development for middle school teachers in North Carolina increases at least through 12 to 15 years of experience, and then it levels off. But the bottom line is teachers with a lot of experience are more effective than those with, say, two to three years um, of ex experience. Now, what do I mean um, by teachers becoming more effective? Our main measure is the same type of measure that Raj Chetty uses. We look at effects on student test scores. So teachers become more effective in raising student test scores. But we also look at some other measures. We look at um, teachers' ability to reduce student absences, teachers' ability to, or effectiveness in uh, reducing offenses, like disturbances in the class and, and uh, various things like that, and also teachers' ability to encourage students to read outside uh, the classroom. So what we find is teacher experience um, um, matters, and matters a lot. Um, so both the impacts on test scores and the other uh, measures matter. The test score increases matter for the reason that Professor Chetty just talked about. Um, that's going to lead to 
uh, better long-term outcomes. But these other measures are important as well, and I'm going to come back to them. Um, I need to be somewhat careful here, though. I'm not saying all experienced teachers are more effective than all less experienced teachers. Obviously, there's a lot of variation in ability uh, and capacity for teachers at any one level of experience. Also, it may well be the case that given the way teacher policies work in this state and other states, that some of our highest ability teachers leave the profession before they become experienced teachers. So you end up with a, a, a lower proportion of high ability teachers in the high experience range just because of this differential uh, rate of departure. But if we combine our conclusion, but let me just restate the main point. If you take two teachers with the same ability and same motivation, the one with more experience is likely to be far more effective than the one uh, with less experience. So if we combine our conclusion that teachers become more effective in raising student test scores with Professor Chetty's findings about the link between test scores and future economic process, we conclude that one of the main tasks for policymakers is to first attract, recruit, and attract high quality and able candidates to the profession, but then to provide them the support that they need to develop, and finally to do everything we can to ret retain them so that the state benefits from their experience. I'll come back and say a bit more about that at the end. Um, I don't have a lot of time today, um, so I'm just going to briefly talk about one other strand of research that I've been doing with Duke uh, colleagues, Charles Klopfelter and Jacob Vigdor. Uh, this has to do with the uneven distribution of teachers across schools. Now, in this work, we look at the qualifications of teachers, things like the licensure test scores of teachers, the experience, years of experience, whether teachers have, are national board certified, whether they're lateral entrants, um, uh, whether they went, graduated from a competitive undergraduate institution. No matter what measure we look at, we find that the schools serving the more, most disadvantaged students, whether that's defined um, by income or race or whatever, those schools serving the most disadvantaged students end up on average having teachers with the lowest qualifications. We do this separately by each of the qualifications. We can lump the qualifications together. We have an uneven distribution of teachers across schools uh, in this state. I would argue that that matters a lot as we think about equity issues or any of our goals related to teacher quality. We are currently not meeting the goal of putting a high quality teacher in front of each student. Um, we're, we're in fact far from that goal, as most other states are as well, but I think we can work harder to even out this distribution. Um, and it matters if we think about trying to put incentives in to make teachers more effective, we need to worry about the capacity of some of those teachers to respond. Many teachers do have that capacity, but if we've got our teachers with the least qualifications in some of these schools, they're not going to be able to respond to any incentives that we might try to place in front of them. And then finally, if we had a policy of deselecting the bottom 5% of the teachers, that was sort of the experiment that Professor Chetty was talking about, we would lose teachers um, disproportionately in the schools at the bottom of um, the distribution, where bottom is the schools serving the most disadvantaged um, students. So then we raised the question, how are we going to attract and retain teachers in those schools? So now let me turn to the policy implication of Professor Chetty's work. Um, and I'll begin by just saying his work is really impressive. Um, nobody else that I know of has been able to take all the student data, match it up to the uh, test score, uh, to the tax data, which is an important thing to do if you want to look at 
long-run impacts such as wages or earnings or income or probability of going to college. Um, the work is terrific, but I do have some concerns about the policy implications that his, some of his co-authors have spread about this work and that many other people have writ, read into the work. Um, in particular, he and his co-authors in the paper assert, and I quote, that the findings provide policymakers with guidance on how to measure and improve teacher quality. So the implication there is that policymakers should make greater use of student test scores to evaluate teachers. But I'd like to look at this conclusion a lot more closely. First question is, what do we mean by a good teacher? Well, Professor Chetty was very clear about that. A good teacher, as he's measured it, is a teacher who has high value added. That means the teacher is able to um, raise the test scores of uh, her students. Um, and presumably, the test scores there are measuring the cognitive ability of the students. And then Professor Chetty justifies this focus on test scores by saying these students who then get the high test scores have better long-term outcomes, presumably because they have higher cognitive skills. The question I want to ask is why are we focusing on cognitive skills alone? Why aren't we also focusing on non-cognitive skills? Now, non-cognitive skills can mean lots of different things. I'm, I'm using the term generally here to refer to things such as adaptability of the students, motivation, perseverance, self-control, ability to work in groups. And some of you in this audience might prefer to use the term 21st century skills for some of these uh, skills that I'm talking about. Um, now, it turns out the data show from a variety of studies that these non-cognitive skills are often more important for adult success than are the cognitive skills that are measured, albeit imperfectly, by student test scores. There's an economist at uh, Northwestern named uh, Kiribo Jackson who's used data, national data, from NELS, which is the National Educational Longitudinal Study, to, sh to show the importance of um, these non-cognitive skills for, for future outcomes in the form of higher wages, lower arrest rates, and higher probabilities of going to college. Now, the important thing about the Kiribo Jackson study is he then added to this first work using the national data work on North Carolina teachers. So looking specifically at North Carolina teachers, he finds that teachers have meaningful effects on the non-cognitive outcomes that he had already shown and emphasized are important for long-term outcomes. And in fact, he's well aware of the Chetty work. He then redoes some of the work just in terms of uh, simulations, and he argues that good teachers may matter even more for long-term outcomes than is implied by the Chetty work. The difference is his measure of a good teacher is one that not only raises test scores, but also pays attention to these non-cognitive uh, skills. So the point is, as we, if we take this broader perspective, a good teacher is one who, at a minimum, develops not just the cognitive skills of the students, but also non-cognitive skills, with the further recognition that the development of the non-cognitive skills may be particularly important for those who are likely to end up uh, in the low-wage part of the labor market. Now, I have used the term at a minimum. That's what a good teacher is. Clearly, a teacher does many other things as well, uh, such as collaborating with other teachers in the school, taking on leadership roles as appropriate, working productively with, a, with parents, sharing with children. And this, I think, is the most important thing, the excitement of learning things that will enrich their lives in the future, independent of whether those outcomes show up in higher wages or in other measurable ways. So if we want teachers to develop non-cognitive 
as well as cognitive skills. What does this mean for the evaluation of teachers? My answer is that we need to be extremely careful about using student test scores, as, which are at best a, a, a measure of cognitive skills to evaluate teachers. And I have at least four reasons for this, um, this message that we need to be careful about using student test scores. One is clearly not all teachers who are effective at raising student test scores are equally effective at developing non-cognitive skills. So hence, one danger, if we put too much focus on the student test scores, is that we will misidentify many teachers. Some teachers um, will appear less effective if we just use test scores than they really are because they're good not only at raising test scores, but raising uh, or increasing non-cognitive skills as well. And then some teachers may look as if they're not very effective, when in fact they're quite effective in uh, promoting non-cognitive skills. Second reason to, to play down the focus on the student test scores, the value-added measures that Professor Chetty was talking about, is too much focus on them will distort teacher behavior. Um, if the, if the, a key thing that teachers are being evaluated on, and the only sort of clear objective measure that they're being evaluated on is value added, their ability to raise test scores. That gives them an incentive to raise test scores when in fact we would like teachers to do many other things than raise uh, test scores. Now there are two types of distortions we might need to worry about here. One is just whether teachers will teach narrowly to the test and not teach the broader learning skills, even in the cognitive dimension, um, that we might like. And, and just as an aside, um, that type of distortion is not in Chetty's study. The data he was looking at comes from a big district, which he doesn't identify, a big district at a time when teachers were not being evaluated for gains in test scores. So there's no distortion in his data, but there could be distortion in practice. And then the other type of distortion is just the more general one. Um, if we focus on cognitive skills as measured by test scores, teachers will do more of that. They may do it well, and students may learn a lot, but if that's at the cost of less focus on these other skills, which in fact are equally important and in some cases more important for long-term outcomes for children, uh, that would not be desirable. So um, my third point here about why we want to not overemphasize teacher test scores is that evaluating teachers by the test scores of their students sends the wrong signal to existing teachers. Most teachers do not believe that the, their main role is to help students do well on multiple choice tests. Such a focus makes teaching less appealing and will, will and in this state, has been inducing some teachers to leave the profession. The very experienced teachers that we'd like to keep in this profession. So that's, so anything that sends those teachers away, makes them discouraged about this endeavor that they are participating in is undesirable in terms of the um, goals that Professor Chetty um, was talking about. And then finally, I worry about how too much emphasis on teacher, on the test scores, on the value added um, measures, uh, I worry about its impact on new teachers, potential teachers. I worry that it will discourage new teachers from entering the profession. And that would happen for um, one of two reasons. One reason that teachers, potentially good teachers, effective teachers, um, might shy away from the profession is they would worry that the main thing they're gonna be evaluated on um, is only part of what they think they're doing and only part of the reason for entering uh, teaching. The other is the point that um, Professor Shetty mentioned briefly, and that's 
the uncertainty that goes along with these measures. Every estimate he gave was average effects for teachers, teachers with high value added versus low value added. It's really hard in many cases to go from that to the evaluation of an individual teacher. So there's a lot of noise there, and that can scare away new teachers coming in. If the evaluation that's going to be done is noisy, has a lot of random error in it, and if that then leads to different salary increases or perhaps even dismissal, that's not the type of profession that would attract the high quality professionals that we'd like in this um, area. So let me just end by referring back to the earlier comments I made about the importance of teacher experience. And what I said then is we need to attract high quality, high potential teachers um, to teach in this state. I believe that firmly, and I don't have much to say about that here. But then, given that teachers become better with experience, they grow on the job, we need to be doing everything we can to help those teachers develop. And as I think about a teacher evaluation system, its main purpose, as I think about it, is to provide information that can be useful to teachers and their supervisors to help them develop to become the better teachers that we want them to, to be and, and that they have the potential to be. And then finally, just coming back to the experience issue, we need to do whatever we can to retain experienced, high quality teachers in this profession. If we don't do that, we're losing all the economic benefits that Professor Chetty was talking about and that I think are even greater than that for good teachers as defined by teachers who not only raise um, the test scores of their students but contribute in other ways to these non-cognitive and other skills that are perhaps even more important for the economic vitality of this state. Thank you.